Hey everyone, welcome to Faith. My name is Doug. We're so glad that you've decided to join us today. Wherever you may be watching from and whoever you may be watching with, we just want to say thank you for joining us and deciding to spend the next 45 minutes or so with us today as we continue in our message series entitled Kingdom Citizens. We'd love for you to share this message on social media. This is one of the ways we can believe we can spread the good news of Jesus across New England with as many people as possible. If you'd like to partner with us today, the best way to do that is to just simply by going to faithauburn.info and clicking the button that says give. You can give a one-time gift or you can uh, have a scheduled regular gift that gets set up. Because of your generosity, we're able to do what we do today, so thank you very much. If you're new with us, or if you'd just like to find out how you can connect further with our community, we'd encourage you to head to faithauburn.info or you can text the word 508 to 97,000 or you can scan the QR code on your screen and we'd love to help you get connected this season. With all that being said, our weekend experience is here and it starts right now. Are you a rule follower or a rule breaker? Some of us are the kind of people who stand at a crosswalk and wait for the green light before we cross the street, while others of us might not even be near the crosswalk, let alone waiting for a green light. Do you drive the speed limit or do you see it more as a suggestion? To quote the Pirates of the Caribbean, the code is more like guidelines than actual rules. Some of us live to break the rules, but here's the thing. Rules can actually be for our good. Parents, you know this. Enforcing a rule to hold your hand while you cross the street is a good thing. It's a freeing thing. The, the freedom is found in the promise that if you hold my hand, you stay alive. And how about the rule to not put metal forks in electrical outlets? I think that's a pretty good rule. But parents, you also know that there are some rules that we make that just don't make sense. Or at least the rules that we, don't, uh, we choose not to explain to our kids. And they say, why? And we say, because I said so. <laughs> Didn't that just frustrate you as a kid? You wanted an explanation for why you couldn't watch that movie or why you couldn't wear that outfit outside of the house. And as kids, we have a tendency to rebel against the rules. But when we grow up, we can understand more of the reason behind the rules. But we still rebel against them. And why is that? Why are we so prone to rebellion, prone to pushing the limits. And I think the reason is that we don't just want to be rule breakers, we want to be rule makers. We want to control our own destiny. We, we set out our own rules and to not live under the oppression of someone else's rules over us. All right, let's, let's get real for a second. We live in a nation that celebrates our freedom to choose who will make those rules for us. We don't live in a kingdom where one person rules over us. Uh, we used to, but that was centuries ago. Uh, but now we live in a democracy where we have freedom to elect presidents, senators, governors, Supreme Court justices. And together, these people that we elect decide upon rules for us to follow. And our civil duty is to vote for people and policies. But if there's something that we can all agree on, it's the fact that we can't all agree. <laughs> the, the fact that we can't all agree on what rules are best to follow as a society. We can't agree on who should be in power. We live in a time where civility and respect are things of the past. We are not the United States of America. We're divided. Left versus right, Democrats versus Republicans, the mudslinging and exploitations, accusations and verbal assassinations of character. I mean, did you watch the presidential debates back in October? We have lost our sense of civility and no person and no position is off limits. There's no way to stand in the gap in the middle and not be criticized by a side. 
we're asked to, to take sides. And many of us placed you know, all of our eggs in the basket of a political party. We went all in on Trump or all in on Biden. If, if, if or when things didn't go our way, we don't go down without a fight. Many of us have prioritized our politics over people. We've unfriended and unfollowed people because we disagree with their perspective. And come on, as a society, we have lost the ability to sit with someone that we disagree with, have a dialogue, and walk away maintaining the relationship. You know, when George Floyd was murdered last year, it was a catalytic moment for our country and, and a catalytic moment for our church as we made a commitment to stand up against racial injustice and inequality. That we are going to embark in the difficult but necessary journey of racial reconciliation. But in taking that stance, some warned us that we were sounding too democratic. And since when we would, uh, since, since when, uh, let me just say this, since when would we allow a political party to lead the way in an issue that is central to the heart of God? Why would we let that be a democratic agenda when it should be an agenda of the church first and foremost, that we would speak into uh, this darkness that we see in this world? And should we, it, should, it should be central to the mission of God's people. And this is not a political issue. This is a human problem. Our society is broken. Our nation is divided. And we might be American citizens, but we've lost our sense of civility. And it's on both sides. You, you can't pin the blame on one side or the other. All of us, we, we've lost our sense of civility. But for those of us who are Christians, we cannot forget this one thing. We are not only American citizens. We have dual citizenship. We belong to another kingdom, and our citizenship to this kingdom must take precedence over our citizenship to America. So this series we're embarking on today is called Kingdom Citizens. What does it mean to be a kingdom citizen? And, and first, we, we have to ask the question, what is the kingdom of God? Author Grammy Goldsworth offers this definition, and we're going to be kind of using this throughout the entire series, that the kingdom of God is God's people in God's place under God's rule and blessing. God's people in God's place under God's rule and blessing. Now, if you're new to Christianity, maybe you recently became a Christian, or maybe you're just, you know, kind of checking us out. You're just a fly on the wall, just listening in, and you're not there yet. This might be a new concept to you. The kingdom of God. I don't, I don't know what comes to mind when you think of the, the word kingdom, perhaps Lord of the Rings or Game of Thrones. The concept of a kingdom may seem like a foreign fairy tale. If you're a Christian, when you hear that, you, that you're a citizen of the kingdom of God, you know, as lovely as a notion as that is, it just does not seem relevant to our everyday lives. It's much more tangible to consider our American citizenship. You know, we have documents that declare that. We have birth certificates, we've got driver's license, we've got passports, and all of these document our citizenship in America. But our citizenship in the kingdom of God can feel nebulous and vague. But as much as the kingdom of God might seem like a distant and indistinct concept, what I hope to show you today is that not only is this important, but this is actually the most important theme throughout the Bible, throughout Scripture. This is the central theme that ties the whole Bible together, the story that God has been writing since creation, and the story He will continue to write until all things are restored. So the kingdom of God is the central story for all of life. It's the central story for your life. And if you miss this today, you're, you're going to find yourself fighting for your own rights and fighting for your own rule, but missing out on the greatest blessing of all. Now today we're going to cover a lot of ground. We're going to go a long way. So I'm going to just need you to kind of brace yourself and stay with me. So are you with me? That's the part where you'd say, you know, I'm with you. And if you were here in, in our building, you'd say that. So if you're watching with people at home, just maybe turn to them right now and say, brace yourself. Let's go. Right. And if you're watching with your pets, turn to your pets and say, listen, the bus is leaving. It's time to go. Bus is leaving. Time to go. Okay. So here we go. We're going to dive into the very first book of scripture. And we're just going to get started right here. We got a lot of ground to cover. In Genesis, the first book of the Bible, God establishes his kingdom on earth. And at creation, we see the pattern of the kingdom. And if you grew up in the church, you know the story. God created the world 
in seven days. Now, scholars have debated whether it's seven literal days or if it's more of a metaphor and more likely thousands of years. But the point is this, that God created. Well, you say, what about the Big Bang? You know, even, even secular scientists will tell you the Big Bang would have had to start somewhere. It needed someone or something to initiate it. So the point of the message today is not how things came to be, but the fact that God created everything there was out of nothing. And after God created everything, he stopped after all the seven days and he declared that it was very good. Very good. This is the picture and the pattern of the kingdom, the way life was meant to be. But the pinnacle of his creation was Adam and Eve, man and woman, who he created in his own image, which means that every human being should be treated with dignity and worth that comes not from self-actualization. You know, our, our world is all about finding yourself and you know, figuring out who you are. It doesn't come from, out, from, from inside of ourselves. It comes from our almighty God himself. You know, under God's rule, every man and woman, no matter the color of their skin, no matter their social or economic status, no matter how young or how old, every single human being should be treated with respect and dignity. That is why I said that racial reconciliation is not a political issue. It's at the heart of God. And it should be at the heart of his people as well. So in the Garden of Eden, we see a picture of life as it was meant to be. We see a pattern of the kingdom of God. God's people, as we, coming back to our definition, God's people, Adam and Eve, in God's place, the Garden of Eden, under God's rule and blessing. So what was the rule? You know the story, perhaps. God commanded them, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. God made one rule, and if they obeyed it, they would experience his blessing. What were those blessings? It says that Adam and Eve were both naked and they felt no shame. Come on, is there a greater blessing than that? Seriously, within God's rule, they experienced the greatest blessings. There was no shame. There was no uh, feeling, uh, uh, feelings of inadequacy. They were provided for. They were satisfied. They experienced the blessing of perfect relationship with each other and perfect relationship with their creator. There was no division. There was no drama. There was no comparison, insecurity. There was no porn. There was no credit card debt. There was no cancer. There was no coronavirus. This was simply a perfect place with perfect relationships and complete wholeness found in union with God. But with all the blessings, they lacked one thing. They weren't God. They didn't call the shots. They weren't in control. They were under God's rule. But through the serpent, they were convinced to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What was their motivation? The serpent tells them in Genesis 3, 4 through 5, You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, the tree, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. So you will be like God. You, you don't have to be ruled over. You can make the rules and have life the way you want it. And Adam and Eve thought that life would be better if they lived independently of God. They wanted power. And they wanted control over their lives. So they took matters into their own hands and they ate of the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. As a result, God banished them from the place of his kingdom, the Garden of Eden, and there was the development of this plague called sin. Those, those perfect relationships that they once had were now broken relationships. And in their rebellion, we see the perished kingdom. And this rebellion would be a pattern to be repeated throughout the entire Old Testament. And, and, and if there's nothing else you hear today, this word rebellion is one we're going to come back to time and time again. A rebellion can just kind of bring up these feelings of uh, guilt and shame. And we're going to come back to that. They were no longer God's people. They were no longer in God's place. And they were no longer under God's rule and blessing. They were cursed by sin because they disobeyed God. Adam and Eve leave the garden and have two sons, Cain and Abel. And just a few verses after they have been banished from God's kingdom, their son, Cain, kills his brother Abel. Throughout the next few chapters of Genesis, you see evil and wickedness abound. Humanity has lost their way as they decide for themselves how to live, how to treat other people, 
uh, not according to their God-given dignity. But in Genesis 12, we come to a turning point through a man named Abram. God made a promise to Abram that says this. He said, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. See, in Abraham, we see the promised kingdom. God makes a promise to Abraham that he is going to reestablish his kingdom through Abraham's descendants. Kings will come from him. Once again, they will be God's people in God's place under God's rule and blessing. And God says that all the families on earth will be blessed through you. The kingdom of God is the central story for all of life. It's the central story for all of life. And God isn't done with his people. The story is not over. There is a promised land where they would experience the blessing of God under his rule. But as the story unfolds, the people wait. And then fast forward to the second book of the Bible, Exodus. Uh, And from Exodus to Deuteronomy, this is the journey that happens. The Israelites, the people of God, are enslaved to the Egyptians under Pharaoh. And they've got to be wondering, did God's promise fail? We thought God was our ruler, but, but we're being ruled by Pharaoh. We thought we were God's people, but we're slaves to these Egyptians. We've lost our identity as God's people. We've lost the blessing. We've lost the promise. But God wasn't done. He remembered his promise. And he was determined to reestablish his kingdom once again. And so through Moses, he led the Israelites out of their slavery through the, the, the Red Sea where he parted it and they, they left and he, he brought them right into the wilderness. And it was at Mount Sinai where God gave them his rules, the Ten Commandments and other guiding principles that they were to follow. And if they were to follow these rules, they would experience his blessing. So Moses goes up on the mountain. He leaves the people behind in camp. He he goes up on the mountain. He receives the stone tablets. You know, and he writes on the stone tablets everything that God commands. And he comes down the mountain. And what does he see? He he sees the, the people in the camp have already rebelled against God's authority. And they made a golden calf to worship. You know, just moments Right, right moments earlier than this, they were worshiping God. They were praising God. But here they are, and they've completely turned their backs on God. But in God's mercy, he tells Moses, he says, I, I made a promise to Abraham. I made a promise to Isaac. I made a promise to Jacob. And, and I'm going to see that promise through. You, Moses, you are going to lead the people to the promised land. And I'm going to go with you. And so it was through, not Moses, but Joshua, for other reasons we don't have time to get into, but Joshua ended up leading his people into God's place, the promised land, where they could live under his rule and his blessing. So they've reached the promised land. All is fulfilled. God's kingdom is established. But once again, they enter the land, they forget the laws and the rules God put in place. And they rebel against God once again. In the book of Judges, it says, In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. It sounds like the rebellion in the Garden of Eden. It sounds like the rebellion of those of us in America today. It sounds like the central problem of humanity. Who makes the rules? Who calls the shots? Who decides how we treat one another? Who is in charge? The kingdom of God. Is the central story for all of life. We keep coming back to this theme of, of God establishing his kingdom on earth and humanity rebelling against God and God in his mercy promising to reestablish his kingdom on earth. And so after their period of rebellion, the Israelites, they had no king, but they wanted a king. 
But their motive was that so that they could be like the other nations around them. Because the other nations around them had kings. And the other nations around them were, you know, strong and mighty because of these kings. So they're rejecting God's kingship over them. They're saying, God, you aren't enough. We need a human king. And so God, in his mercy, gives them what they want. Saul becomes king. But Saul is this king that is constantly rebelling against God. He's constantly doing things his own way. And he's, he's breaking all the rules and the commands of God. So God raises up another king. This is a king that is a man after God's own heart. King David. You know the story of David and Goliath. That's that King David. And in King David, we see a potential for God's kingdom to really Reign. Under David's reign, Israel experiences the blessings of God. You know, a little tangent here. In, under David's reign, they begin to build the temple of God. And in the temple of God, God's presence is fully manifested in that place. In, in ways that it hadn't been. You know, they had experienced it in the, the wilderness and, you know, in various ways. But God, uh, David builds this temple for God to dwell in. You know, and, and, and here in this place is where, where they experience God's blessings. But, again, rebellion. It's short-lived because David was not perfect. David was a leader like every other leader that there ever has been. Imperfect and prone to rebellion. And his lust led him to commit adultery with a woman named Bathsheba who was married to a man that David had murdered. So David now is an adulterer. He's a murderer. He rebels against God. But God, in his mercy, you're seeing a pattern here. There's a mercy of rebellion and God being merciful to people who constantly turn their back on him, constantly rebel against him. And God, in his mercy, speaks to David through a prophet named Nathan. And he says, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Despite Israelites' rebellion, and despite David's rebellion, God's promise still stands. He will establish his kingdom on earth, but it might not be in the way or in the time that they would expect it. So David's son Solomon reigns, and as king, uh, but, but he rebe- rebels against God's reign. Solomon's son Rehoboam reigns and as king, but he rebels against God's reign. And so something happens right after Rehoboam's reign. Civil war breaks out in Israel, north versus south, Israel and Judah. And because of this split, the two nations become vulnerable to surrounding nations. You know, before they wanted a king so they could be invulnerable, so they could be strong. But it's their, their, it's, it's their weakness and their splitting apart in the civil war that led them to be vulnerable to surrounding nations. So they're conquered by the Assyrians And the Babylonians would then, after that, conquer them. And so here they are. They're living as exiles in Babylon. And throughout this period, uh, this is where we, we, in the Bible, look to the prophets. And the prophets warned the people. They said, this is happening because of your rebellion against God's rule. Uh, That's why you're conquered. But the prophets didn't just have bad news. They also had some good news. And they spoke about a future Messiah. A king who would come to fulfill the promise made to Abraham, the promise made to Isaac, the promise made to Jacob, the same promise made to David. It's the promise that God would reestablish his kingdom on earth. And despite their rebellion, God would mercifully provide a way of blessing again. So the people must have thought that that time had come when they were allowed to return from exile in Babylon. But God was silent. So they waited, and they waited. For about 400 years, yeah, that's right, 400 years they waited. I mean, mean, 400 years is a long time for God to be silent. And that's how the Old Testament ends. You get to the last book of the Old Testament, you finish it, and there's a period of silence. Maybe you're in that place. You feel like you have just messed up so bad. You feel like God's angry with you. You've rebelled against him. You, you're wondering when he's just going to just smite you. <laughs> you feel God is just done with you and you're here to just kind of live out your days till you die. Let me tell you this. God is not done with you. The promise still stands. He is reestablishing his kingdom on earth and he is inviting you 
to be a part of it. The kingdom of God is the central story for all of life. It's the central story for your life. It's the central story for my life. You know, I think back to my life and I think to the rebellion and and the times where I have rebelled against the authority of God. Growing up, you know, coming back to that original question, are you a rule breaker or a rule follower? I was a rule follower. I was a great kid growing up. I grew up in, in this church here. I grew up, right? And I followed all the rules. I did everything. But like Adam and Eve, I felt like it wasn't enough. I lacked kind of just this popularity and this control over my life. And I wanted to experience life that I hadn't experienced before. And so I started to rebel against God. You know, quietly, I was, I was very subtle about it. Um, not many people knew, you know, my, my parents didn't know. But what I started doing is I started hanging out with some, some friends in high school. We started drinking and we started smoking pot. And I started kind of, you know, just getting around in different ways and living a life that really was not congruent with following Jesus. And I still read my Bible here and there. And I still, you know, I was even still leading worship on stage. And I was kind of just living this double life. And I was one person on the weekends, you know, one person Saturday night. And then Sunday morning, I'd stumble into church and lead worship. And that's the person that I was. You know, and, and even into college, I went to a Christian college thinking, okay, Christians, they don't do any of this stuff. I'm going to kind of clean my life up, right? And I got to college and I found the parties and I found all that stuff. But it was about halfway through uh, my junior semester where I just felt God kind of pointing me towards this crossroads. And I could go one way and continue to just rebel against him or I could choose to surrender. I could choose to say, God, I- I'm yours. I want, I want, I want y- you to rule over me. And I'm done making the rules for myself. And, and there was this crossroads and I, I dropped to my knees and I said, God, I'm done. I'm done trying to make rules for my life. I'm done trying to, uh, to, to live a life where I'm seeking my own pleasure. And I want to just surrender my life to you. If, if you're in this place of, of just emptiness and you, you're constantly coming up empty every, every single weekend, every single vacation, you're feeling like it's never enough. You know, you, you're chasing after something. I would just encourage you today. Don't run from that feeling of emptiness, but use it to propel you into surrender to God. And so after 400 years of silence, God broke the silence. You know, at this point, the Israelites are living under the authority and rule of Rome. It's the same story, different ruler, right? At first it was the Egyptians back in the days of Moses. Then it was the Assyrians and the Babylonians. And now here they are. They're they're being ruled by the Romans, Any hope of their kingdom being reestablished is gone at this point. In in, in the New Testament, in Mark 1, 15, we are introduced to a man named Jesus. You may have heard of him. (laughs) And Jesus says this, The time has come. The time has come. This word come literally translates to fulfilled. The time is fulfilled. The prophets They were speaking about this. The the promises all spoke about this. This is happening in your midst. The time has come. He said, the kingdom of God has come near. The waiting's over. God's king has come to reestablish his kingdom. The kingdom of God is at hand. It is here. It is available for you to enter into it if you want. You're feeling empty. Are you tired? Are you worn out? Burned out? Come to Jesus. So the people, they're intrigued, you know, because they've never heard someone speak with this kind of authority. You know, this man claims to be the Messiah, the King, and he demonstrates miracles and illustrates teachings that all point to this kingdom of God. But where is this kingdom and how do we get into it? And while the people were looking for a physical kingdom where They could be kind of free from this Roman rule. Jesus was talking about another kingdom. He's talking about a kingdom that is already here, but still to come. He's talking about a kingdom that is invisible, but it's being revealed right before their very eyes. A kingdom where the king doesn't take control and rebel against the authority, but one in which the king lays his life down in surrender. And he models the way for you and I to lay our lives down and surrender. A kingdom where the king 
came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for the, for the people of the kingdom, for you. Jesus laid down his life. He went to the cross and he stretched out his arms and he, he did it for you. So how do you enter the kingdom? Jesus tells us, he says, repent and believe the good news. Repent and believe the good news. To repent is to turn away from rebellion against God's rule. It's to confess and say, God, I am sorry for the ways I've rebelled against your authority. To believe is to cling to the promise of the kingdom. It's to believe that this king is good and that his rule and his authority is the greatest blessing there ever could be. Is there anyone who is as good as King Jesus? I'm telling you, Trump isn't. I'm telling you, uh, Biden isn't. No one could be as great a ruler and as great a king worth giving our lives to. So, so let's, let's put things in proper perspective here. We are citizens of the kingdom of God first because the king is good. This is the greatest news. It's, it's the good news. It's the best news that there ever could be that God has not left us in our rebellion against his rule. In his mercy, God has made a way for us to enter his kingdom if we will repent and if we will believe. We can be his people in his place under his rule and his blessing. And if you tried to make your own rules, if you tried to rebel against God, welcome to the human race. Each of us have stumbled along the way and sinned in the same ways that Adam and Eve did. But you know where that's gotten you. On the other side of rebellion is just emptiness, pain, despair, loneliness. But in the kingdom of God, we experience union with our Creator. We experience forgiveness. We experience mercy. We experience the blessing of being under the rule of the only one who is truly good, our King. So today, surrender. Surrender to, to Jesus. Surrender to him. Repent. Turn from your rebellion and say, God, I'm sorry. This isn't bad news. This isn't shame where you come to God and you're like, oh, I'm so ashamed. You're just going to, you know, spite me. No, this is an opportunity. It's the best news. It's the good news for you to come and repent and believe the good news. Let me pray for us. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you are the good king. And today, we, we, we worship the king of kings. We worship the Lord of lords. God, no one else is worthy like you. All the law and the prophets pointed to you. And the time has come. The time has been fulfilled in you. Open our eyes to see your kingdom around us. Open our eyes to experience the kingdom blessings here and now. Though we wait for it someday where we will be with you in glory, we want to experience that now, in the here and now. God, we live in a, a nation, we live in a world that's full of brokenness. It's full of all kinds of things that can pull us and propel us towards submission to people and things that are not worthy of being submitted to. So God, may we submit ourselves to the only one who is good, to the only one who is worthy. Jesus, we thank you and we worship you today. We pray this in your name. Amen.
God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. And through Christ, our amen ascends to God for his glory. <laughs>